Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. Today is uh, Monday, April 15, 2024. And we do have a quorum present. Uh, due to the late start because of uh, floor session, we are going to hear one item from our agenda today. That is Senate file 4480, Senator Kunish, Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act modification. Senator Kunish. Thank you so much for um, convening this and, and helping us get this through, um, Senator Latz. We, I have, um, before we begin, I have the A3 amendment. Um, and the A3 amendment um, basically just updates and uh, corrects some of the language within the bill, um, making sure that it is in the order that we want it to be uh, for final passage. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Kunish, this is not the first committee, so it's not an author's amendment. Oh. I want you to uh, tell us uh, the key points of the bill. Um, sure. Looking for counsel to tell us exactly what is within our jurisdiction, but okay. you know, I'm not available yet. If you know, go ahead and you can tell us that. All right. So to the bill. Um, members, last year uh, I brought in front of you a modification of the MIFPA bill, Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act. Um, that was an urgent need here in Minnesota to ensure that uh, should ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act, go away at the federal level, our Minnesota um, uh, native uh, tribes and families have the preservation and the ability to keep the uh, keep an eye on what happens for their their children. The Federal Indian Child Welfare Act established. Uh, procedures and requirements for child custody proceedings that involve an in Indian child. The Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, or MIFA, was originally enacted in 1985 to strengthen and expand upon, upon parts of ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act. In the 2023 legislative session, the legislature codified ICWA into the state MIFPA statutes, adding a purpose statement and added additional definitions and clarifications. This bill in front of you, Senate File 4480, further modifies MIFPA by amending definitions and making technical and conforming changes. Additionally, the bill modifies uh, notice requirements for child placement proceedings, inquiry procedures, and the appointment of counsel in child placement proceedings involving an Indian child. And there's, there's three different areas that it makes um, the major changes in. The first is changes to facilitate compliance with ICWA and MIFPA. An often overlooked issue is, com uh, is compliance with ICWA at the federal level and then at the state level, MIFMA, in child custody proceedings involving uh, an Indian child that are not coming into court system as a child protection case. ICWA and MIFPA apply to all cases where a child defined as an Indian child is or may be removed from care, control, and custody of the Indian child's parents or Indian custodian who cannot have the child returned to their care simply by asking. This does not include custody between parents, uh, custody between parent and Indian custodians or juvenile offenses that are not status offenses. Any other situation that may result in the child being removed from the care, custody and control of the parent or Indian custodian are cases where ICWA and MIFPA apply. The 23-24 MIFPA phase two work focused on making compliance with ICWA and MIFPA more clear and easier to understand for practitioners in areas of law where compliance with ICWA and MIFPA are often overlooked. So specifically, um, statute 260.761B requires courts to inquire into lineage, possible membership on the record during the hearing. 260C.178 requires compliance with placement preference during emergency removal. 260.761 clarifies notice provisions. Uh, 260.762 clarified active effort provisions, especially for voluntary placement. Uh, then it goes on to others that clarify jurisdiction, including transfer to tribal court, good cause to deny transfer, and deference to uh, tribal determination of exclusive jurisdiction. 
appointment of counsel for parents, Indian custodians, and children in non in non chips cases, the return of out of home placement costs to parents if any were proceedings had been invalidated, and then allows the court to impose sanctions and costs where proceedings are invalidated where uh, uh, appropriate. That's all under changes to facilitate compliance. Then they worked on improvements to facilitate uh, tribal participation in hearings, which is really, really important. And we learned that there are a large number of struggles that tribes, especially those located out of state, face when trying to participate in hearings. The following changes were made to facilitate tribal participation in hearings. So under 260.775 subdivision 20A, tribal refs are not engaged in unauthorized practice of law. And then in 260.771, tribal reps are exempt from pro, pro hoc vice, no filing fees, do not have to use FE file and service systems and may appear remotely. And then the third part is the study of child placement and permanency. A multidisciplinary team will evaluate what permanency um, timelines and practices in child welfare proceedings will be looked at. And uh, Mr. Chair and members, that is the bill. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Uh, council, can you identify for us if there are any particular parts of the bill or all of the bill that are within our jurisdiction? Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, it's the whole bill. Thanks for narrowing it down for us. <laughs> All right, members, you got 30 seconds to read uh, 47 pages. Um, all right, and uh, Senator Kunish, could you give us uh, a brief description of the A3 amendment then as well? All right, the A3 amendment, um, as I said, does provide for clarification and um, uh, use of specific words within custody and placement um, and just puts the bill in the order that it's, it needs to be in. Thank you. Before we take on the amendment, we'll hear from the testifiers that are here. Uh, uh, James Ryan from the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, Deputy Solicitor General. So you, Mr. Ryan, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am James Ryan, Deputy Solicitor General for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Thank you for having me, thank you for having us, and thank you for consideration of this bill. Minnesota law recognizes that the best interests of the children or, or Indian child are interwoven with the best interests of the child's tribe. Why is that? The child's tribe is where a child can find a sense of belonging. It is important for the child's sense of identity, and it is where the child feels at home. Knowing of one's culture is not the same as living in one's culture. And so the Mille Lacs Band has worked very hard to keep their children with their families and in their communities. Thank you to all of you that have helped uh, with the uh, Mille Lacs Band and other Minnesota tribes to accomplish those goals, especially to Senator Kunish uh, for her tireless work on behalf of tribes. Uh, thank you also to the uh, work group that helped dr draft this bill, uh, and thank you all for your consideration of it. Uh, last year, when federal protection for Indian children and tribes were at risk, Minnesota stood up and said, no matter what happens in Washington, D.C., Minnesota will respect the needs of Indian children and tribal sovereignty. Thank you for that work that had, was done in MIFPA last year. Because of the hurried nature, there was a lot of things that we were not able to get to, but are still vitally important for Indian children and tribes. Uh, the Mille Lacs ban uh, asked that you support this bill. Uh, and uh, thank you again for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Uh, all right, we have some other testifiers, I think all of whom uh, now are on Zoom. Uh, Rebecca McConkie Green, Chief Judge of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Tribal Court. Welcome, Judge. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. It's an honor to be here, and thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule this week to hear this bill. We, we truly appreciate it. And I want to start, as Mr. Ryan did, by expressing gratitude for um, this committee and for the Minnesota legislature in general, um, led last year by Senator Kunish on our, our MIFPA bill that we brought and Representative Keeler. Um, to keep the, the protections of the Indian Child Welfare Act in play in Minnesota. Um, happily, we had a good outcome in the Supreme Court decision, but it was a huge relief to know that the state of Minnesota listens to Indian people and was willing to step up and ensure that those provisions remained in place. As we talked about, um, Last year when, when I testified, I believe I told you that we would be back. And I had said that we would be back because when the testimony came from members of the community and tribal leaders, there was a lot of pain that was difficult testimony to hear. And unfortunately, there was difficult testimony from community members who were testifying in their 80s and community members who were testifying who were younger at young adults and teenagers. So we knew when we were hearing this testimony that we would need to come back, that while the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, as they currently stand, are extremely important, we need to do better. There, there are areas that we can improve. So we started right away after the legislative session last year, um, and we had 187 people on our working, our larger working group. Not all of those people came all the time, um, but everybody got the updates, and we broke into 10 um, subcommittees that, that drafted the work that is before you. Of those 187 people, we had a number of people from the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, um, from MAXA, from AMC, from the Minnesota Bar Association, and then of course from all of the tribes in Minnesota and the organizations that serve Indian people throughout the state of Minnesota. We sought input from all of those people because one of the things that we were working on this year is making sure that while the Indian Child Welfare Act and MIFPA have always applied to any proceedings where children could be taken from the care and custody of their parents, so other proceedings besides child protection, law and practice has tended to focus most on child protection. And we need to make sure that families are protected in other types of proceedings like third party custody and probate proceedings. So we wanted to make sure that we had adequate input to see the struggles that the various people that come into contact with the system would have and to make sure that we were relaying things adequately. Um, so the bill before you, I believe, does that. We have a number of provisions that we're very um, happy to have in the bill and, and believe will go a long ways to towards making things better in the future um, for Indian families and clear for the people that practice in state court proceedings so that there will be less question and um, it will be more obvious what needs to be done. Um, with that, unfortunately, there were a number of things that we didn't, we weren't able to bring forward this year. They need a little bit more work. So um, I'm going to say once again, we hope to be back in front of you next year and probably in the years to come as we continue to work with all of the people connected to the system to make sure that we have good practices in place. And so I am certainly prepared when, when you're ready to go through any portions of the bill that you'd like to discuss. Um, thank, thank you, Judge, for your testimony. Our next testifier is Lori York, Executive Director of the White Earth Nation. Director York. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. So as you recall, last year, under the threat to the pending U.S. Supreme Court decision, the Minnesota legislature had passed amendments to MIFBA that ensured all protections of ICWA would remain in Minnesota. We just wanted to take a little bit of this time to thank you and thank the Minnesota legislature for your leadership ensuring those protections. Your responsiveness to the wishes of the tribes and the testimony of tribal leaders and Indian people set an excellent example for our nation. This year's bill author will improve practice in a manner that ensures greater protections for Indian children, their families, and tribes in the following ways. This legislation provides many practice improvements as it inserts language into several areas of law where ICWA and MIFPA apply but are often overlooked. It provides a mechanism for appointment of counsel to parents and Indian custodians and Indian children in areas of law where counsel is already provided for them, is not already provided for them. It clarifies notice provisions and improves access for tribes. 
It also ensures that tribes are able to provide input to the petitioners and the courts about what it is truly in the best interest of Indian children. And it allows courts to award costs and sanctions where appropriate when the court has invalidated proceedings based on violations of the law. So as you've heard earlier today, and if you recall from last legislative session, there was a number of folks that came together and this was known as the Tribal MIFPA Work Group. Just wanted to thank all of those folks that have um, uh, uh, um, had put their time and effort in moving forward with the language on this MIFPA bill and proposal this year. There was many, there's still many practice improvements that are necessary and the work will be ongoing now and into the future as Judge McConkey Green has indicated. Um, there were letters of supports and or resolutions that were submitted from the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, American Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council, the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, Fond du Lac, Upper Sioux, Leech Lake, and White Earth Nation. In closing, we appreciate any consultation efforts extended by the Minnesota legislature with our tribal nations and thank you for working in partnership with tribes. We look forward to the continued discussion and we are requesting your support um, and approval of this bill proposed before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Director York. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, our last testifier that has signed up is Sadie Hart from the Ainda Young Our Home Center. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sadie Hart, and I'm the Indian Child Welfare Compliance Monitor at the Inda Young Center in St. Paul. Inda Young means our home in Ojibwe, and we provide a healing place within the community for American Indian youth and families to thrive in safety and wholeness. I also chair the Ramsey County ICWA Advisory Board, which advises the Second Judicial District in Ramsey County on issues relating to Indian child welfare and co-chair at the Metropolitan Urban Indian Directors Family Preservation Committee. In my role as the ICWA Compliance Monitor, I work with judges, attorneys, and other justice partners to make sure ICWA and MEFPA are complied with and implement best practices, specifically in Ramsey, Anoka, Dakota, Washington, Carver, and Scott counties. I want to bring your attention to two issues that I commonly see that this, issue, this MIFPA bill would address. The first issue is clarifying the court's responsibility to ask about a child's tribal heritage or ancestry, which needs to happen at the start of the proceeding and continue throughout the family's court involvement. Identifying Indian children early in the process ensures that they receive the full protections of MIFA from the beginning, including active efforts to reunify the family and tribal involvement. Failing to identify Indian children can also delay the court process by needing to redo certain processes or invalidating the case. This inquiry is also required throughout the life of the case. So as new people, such as relatives, come to court, there's a clear obligation to ask about the child's potential tribal ancestry to make sure Indian children are properly identified. We frequently see these requirements being overlooked so children don't get all of MIFPA's projections and tribes aren't notified when their children are involved with the child protection system. The second issue is that we continue to see barriers that prevent tribal representatives from actively participating in the court process. Tribes have party status in MIFPA cases, but there is still a lack of understanding about the importance of their role, the valuable information they can provide the court, and how they collaborate with other parties. This bill addresses that issue by creating a definition for tribal representative and clarifying that a tribal rep does not need to be an attorney. Many tribal reps are social workers and are at times not allowed to speak in hearings because they don't have legal representation. This bill also allows for tribal reps to participate in court hearings remotely without prior request. Tribes have limited resources available to participate in cases and often have cases throughout the state and country. Making it easier for tribes to participate remotely means they can be more actively involved in the court process. These are just a few examples of how this bill would improve the experiences for an Indian child and their family in the child protection system and ensure that tribes are fully involved in the court process. Thank you for your time and for considering this bill. Thank you, Ms. Hart. Um, is there anyone else in the room wish to testify in connection with this bill? Um, all right, we will consider the A3 amendment. Uh, Senator Carlson uh, moves adoption of the A3 amendment. Any discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. 
All right, members, any further discussion or questions about uh, this bill? Senator Wilmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Kroonish, uh, I was looking over this packet that was in our papers entitled Resolution 54-24. It's a resolution from the Chippewa Tribal Executive Committee. That represents six tribal communities, I believe. Um, as some may know, there's 11 tribal communities in the state of Minnesota. I, I flipped through this and I see there's a few uh, Sioux tribes uh, communities uh, in this packet, but are all of the tribes uh, in support of uh, this legislation? Because I couldn't find some of the tribal communities that, that I know are out there, but not represented in this packet of paper. Senator Kunish. Thank you, um, Senator Limmer and um, Mr. Chair. Yes, they are all in 100% support of this. They might have not gotten a letter of support in, but you'll notice the whole Chunk Nation, who are not a federally recognized Minnesota tribe, are, are part of this. But yes, we do not have uh, a single tribe that is not in, in full support of that. And I'm not sure if you have anything to say, state to that. Mr. Ryan. I don't have anything to say to them, uh, but I would also turn to Judge uh, McConkie Green. Judge McConkie Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my understanding is that all the tribes in Minnesota are in support of it. Um, all of, for the most part, the tribes in Minnesota all participated very actively in the work groups, and we came back several times, even throughout the amendment process and checked in with everybody. Um, I have one of the first tribes that provided a resolution in support was Upper Sioux, who wasn't able really to participate in the work groups themselves, but did receive all the updates. And when I had asked for resolutions in support, they provided one right away. I'm also aware um, of support from Lower Sioux certainly has supported very heavily, um, has, as have Prairie Island and Shakopee Midwakanton. Um, I would also point out that I did take the bill to the um, MIAC, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, and I believe with the exception of Upper Sioux, all of the tribes in Minnesota participate in that as well. And that was unanimously supported there at that group as well. And I think there should be a resolution in the packet from them as well. Um, thank you. Thank you, Judge. Chair. Senator Limmer. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, having been here a while, I've, I'm familiar with uh, different requests over the years from tribal communities. Sometimes, and the reason I raised the question earlier is that sometimes tribal communities don't always agree with <laughs> one another. And uh, so I had to ask that question. Uh, however, I also know that Different tribal communities have different uh, amounts of resources. Some are a little, have a little more resource than others. Does this trigger any inadequacies for mm -hmm. supporting a child having, having been uh, directed to uh, uh, a Native American uh, community? Senator Kuhn. Mr. Chair and Mr. Uh, Senator Limmer, um, no, I, if anything, it actually um, bolsters their ability to uh, look out for their, for their children and for their families. But again, um, perhaps uh, Ms. McConkie Green would like to reply to that as she's been so hands-on and um, the force behind a lot of this. Judge McConkie Green. Thank you. Um, so what I would tell you is that we... One of the people that was participating in the work group pointed out to us very early when we were forming committees that there is a problem um, that out-of-state tribes have sometimes with accessing their ability to participate in hearings and understand what is going on. And so there was a lot of that, there was a work group that was formulated specifically to make sure that what we did um, supported access of all tribes, not only the tribes in Minnesota, but keeping in mind that because of former policies of the US government, um, there are tribes that have citizens all around the United States that need to be able to participate in hearings and, and advocate. And one of the things that we want to make sure that we're doing in Minnesota is 
making sure that tribes that are here in Minnesota, but also tribes that are not here in Minnesota can attend the hearings, communicate with social workers, communicate with the other parties, but also being very heavily involved in um, proceedings that are not the how we normally think of of ICWA and MIFPA are not the normal child protection hearings. So we wanted to make sure that those tribes could also participate in family law hearings where ICWA and, and MIFPA issues were coming up and probate hearings and um, other types of cases. So some of the provisions that you see in the bill, for example, the appointment of counsel and the ability to appear electronically, those are the things that those are the types of things that already exists in in Minnesota for child protection cases, but now we're making sure that there's language that is extending those protections to people um, that are have ICWA and MIFPA cases that are not traditional child protection cases. So as Senator Kunish said, we're actually expanding a lot of protections and making sure that people have a, a much greater ability to appear. It can be very expensive um, for tribes to have to fly people all over the country to appear in ICWA and MIFPA hearings. And so hopefully this alleviates a lot of, of that pressure and cost um, for tribes. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I'm trying to recall <clears throat> when we've had discussions about this issue before, and maybe Judge, you could answer this question for me. Um, the child that may be subject to a child protection order um, and not in a tribal community where are they now? Are they in a foster home? Are they, uh, could you just tell me the targeted child that were in their settings so we know where they are and where they want to be drawn from and to an Indian family? Okay. I just want to clarify, uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, to make sure that I understand the question. Senator Limmer, could you restate the question, please? I'll try. Um, uh, Judge, um, where would be a typical child that would be a subject of, of um, seeking custody in uh, an Indian, to, would satisfy the Indian Family Preservation Act? Are they in a foster home? Are they in, do they have a, uh, criminal, uh, minor criminal uh, setting. Could you just tell me what, what and who they are in general? Judge McConkie. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the question, Senator. Um, yes, I'm happy to do that. So cases, the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act actually start protecting children, we hope, long before um, they're actually placed out of home or even part of the court system. The Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act um, back in 2015 was amended to require counties to reach out as soon as they were having contact with children, or, and I should say instead of counties, petitioners, when they were having contact with Indian children that may need to be removed from the care, custody, and control of their parent or Indian custodian. Um, the act in general applies to any such case where the child, where an Indian child could be removed from their parent or Indian custodian, except for a couple of exceptions. Um, it does not apply, for example, when there's a custody action between parents, but it would apply if, if for example, grandma was um, felt that the child wasn't safe in the care of the child's parents and sought custody. Um, it doesn't apply when there's juvenile proceedings that are not status offenses, um, but it does apply in status offenses such as truancy and minor consumption types of things, although we don't usually see that in Minnesota. And um, I feel like I'm missing one. But generally, if there is somebody who is not a parent or an Indian custodian who is seeking to remove the child from the parents, then the act kicks in and applies. Thank you. That. Thanks. Any further questions or discussion on Senate File 4480? I'm not seeing any. Uh, members, the appropriate move now is to pass this bill on to the Finance Committee since there is a fiscal note that does not impl implicate our budget.
Uh, so Senator Pappas moves that Senate file 4480 as amended be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Thank you, um, Chair, and thank you all for meeting and, and getting this through for us. Appreciate it. Senator Herr, we're going to fit you in here. Uh, so, members, uh, we did send out an email indicating that uh, Senator Hur's bill was not going to be heard because of the uh, lateness of the floor sessions at German. Um, this is a. Oh, sorry. Um, there is a fiscal note. It, the idea is to give us some information as we decide what to do with regard to our limited resources. Um, by the end of the week, we will have a budget bill out of this committee as well. So since Senator Herb brought some testifiers in, I'm going to take the uh, prerogative of the chair to have an informational hearing. Um, and uh, uh, if there is anyone who wishes to share information with this committee um, that uh, was not able to join us uh, today because of the email that went out, um, then uh, we, of course, welcome their input um, as we make our decisions. So, Senator Herr, we got about uh, 10 minutes. Um, okay. Mr. Um, Chair? I wanted to give an opportunity for your testifiers that you brought along here to share their information with the committee. Senator Limmer. Mr. Chair, um, I think your staff passed out the wrong yeah. bill. This one's on human breasts. Yes, and, uh, uh, Senator Limmer, the, the uh, correct bill is being passed around now. Okay. Are we going to be hearing? We are. Senate this files? is the only bill that we're going to be hearing yet today. Nothing right. else that was on the original agenda is going to be considered today. All right. Thank you. So Senate file 5243 for an informational hearing. Senator Hurd, why don't you take a few minutes to tell us what this is Thank, about. Thank you, Chair Latz, for making it possible. You know, I know the East St. Paul is not far from here, but we have community, to get, uh, community members together and uh, um, it's a hard, it's a little difficult to organize them to come back. So we'll seek this momentum and thank you for allowing us the time. And uh, I wanted to also thank uh, co-author of the bill, Senator Umu Batum and Senator um, Limmer. And I think uh, Senator Kroon just reached out to me that he'd like to be on the uh, bill as well. And I'll, I'll see if there's still room. I think there is room. So. Um, this bill is asking for uh, funding for fiscal year of 2025 from general fund to the Department of Public Safety for a grant to the Hmong American Mediation, mediation Center to provide mediation and re restorative justice services. The Hmong American Mediation Center has long history of settling dispute in the Hmong community, both culturally but more so following the referral and of, the, of our courts and guidelines their service, their service of com on conflict and resolution involve family dispute, juvenile and family restoration, family counseling, and divorce mediation. When my uh, testifier here, Mr. Chu Wu, came to me, Director Chu Wu came to me uh, with this proposal, he reminded me that still in our culture, in my Hmong culture, uh, when someone married to, when someone, two people are married, they're just not married within themselves, but they're married um, two family together. So resolving dispute within culture could be a little comp um, complicated. So the center like, a center like the Hmong American Mediation can be a good resource to the community to resolve dispute. Uh, their backlog continue to grow. Uh, in addition to small foundation dollars that they have and event fundraising, tow operation, the Hmong American Mediation Center is asking for uh, stake support uh, to um, get them going so they can reduce the backlog that they have. And so I have with me here is uh, Executive Director or also President of the organization, uh, Mr. Chuvu. 
Mr. Chuvu, welcome to the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. If you go ahead and state your name and present us with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Lutz and members of the committee. And thank you, Senator Ho, for authoring our bill. My name is Wu Chu. I am the founder and executive director of the Hmong American Mediation Center. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you my testimony in support of Senate File 5243. Through the direction of the late General Wang Pao, I was appointed as the founder of the Hmong American Mediation Center. I am here today to ask you to support this organization because it plays a vital role in the Hmong and on the Southeast Asian everyday life experience as they are dealing with our legal and law enforcement system. In 2010, when Hmong clan leaders started declining to help mediate family and clanship conflicts and problems within the Hmong community, the conversation of how to bridge the gaps between cultural and ideological differences and legal mediation began dialoguing. To address this issue, the late General Wang Pao appointed me to develop a means to help mitigate the issue facing our community. With the cooperation and support of our state and local law enforcement agency, Ramsey County judges, state judicial departments, and the professor at Hamlin University School of Law, as well as Hmong community leaders. The Hmong American Mediation Center was organized to provide cultural specific family conflicts resolution for Hmong and later include other Southeast Asian community. At first, the Hmong mediation and arbitration was incorporated as a program for, med for the mediation center at Hamlin University. Training for mediators started immediately for Hmong leaders. Hamlin University professor and attorney and judges. The Hmong American Mediation Center officially launched on November 23rd, 2011, when it was fully incorporated as a nonprofit organization. Hmong American Mediation Center mission objective offer alternative to going to court for Hmong and other Southeast Asian. Strengthen Hmong and other Southeast Asian family through cultural connection to reduce divorce, reduce domestic abuse, reduce tragedy happening to the Hmong community and reduce juvenile crime. Provide education to the legal and law enforcement system about traditional versus court system. Assist Hmong and other Southeast Asian to work within the Minnesota court system. To preserve Hmong and other Southeast Asian cultural value. Building bridge and partnership between Hmong and other communities. Hmong American Mediation Center provide the following service, uh, family mediation, civil mediation, arbitration, juvenile, and family restoration, case management. 
Hmong American Mediation Center serves hundreds of family conflicts and restorative of justice service for juvenile in each year. Thank you for your time today and hope you hope for your fully support the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Uh, Senator Hurt, did you have another testifier you wanted to present, um, or is she just available to answer questions? Um, uh, she, 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 um, Ms. Hurt here is fine with our testimony, but if questions arise, she will be happy to answer. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room wanting to testify in connection with this proposal? Any questions or discussion from members of the committee? I'm not seeing any at this time. Uh, so this is sort of a general announcement uh, or a statement, uh, as Senator knows. Uh, we've been given very limited supplemental funds uh, for this uh, spring session here. Um, we have uh, uh, very limited money available to us. There are certainly going to be worthy causes and organizations that are not going to be able to be funded this year. We have not made those decisions yet, but we will be by Friday. We'll be passing our budget out. Um, so it's been helpful to me, and I appreciate mm -hmm. you coming forward to share uh, the information with us. Thank you, Senator Letts and members. Uh, you, we, are at, we are at your discretion on, on this. Uh, uh, I have seen the progress and the uh, effectiveness of the Hmong, Medi Hmong American Mediation Center, and so I know this is late in the game, but it uh, doesn't hurt to uh, submit a request and see where it goes. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much. All right, uh, there being nothing further to come before this committee, let's just uh, talk about the schedule uh, now. We'll be coming back Wednesday. We should anticipate that we'll be meeting during a regular time slot on Wednesday to, uh, to uh, review the uh, budget proposal. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>